we call this Holy Bible the King James Authorized Version because it was translated under a king, and the Bible says where the word of a king is, there's power. Then wouldn't a pope be even more, since, it, since popes are the ones who anoint kings for centuries? But what about emperors? Well, some of you might be familiar with the story of the fiery furnace in the book of Daniel. It's a story about three Judean youths who end up on the wrong end of the Babylonian king's justice system and end up being thrown into a fiery furnace. According to the text, a miracle then occurs. The NRSV reads, He replied, But I see four men unbound, walking in the middle of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the fourth has the appearance of a god. The NRSV helpfully includes a footnote with the alternate translation of the Aramaic word a son of the gods. This translation suggests some sort of angelic being joins the three men in the fire, protecting them. But notice what the KJV translation does. Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the son of God. The translators use the title Son of God rather than the more literal, a Son of the Gods. Son of God is a title for Jesus Christ in the Gospels and makes the verse sound like Jesus was in the furnace with the three men. Uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about was the list that he says here is the exact same list that is in the pamphlet handed out by my church where they list a bunch of different Bibles and mostly the NIV and how these how these verses are taken out or changed but they what they do is they compare it to the king james english bible they don't compare it to the greek or the hebrew so you don't have any starting reference point you're just comparing two english translations which makes no sense at all the logic is gone i wonder if he even knows that king james was bisexual and had a male mistress the irony makes me real makes me actually think that there is a god because it's so funny the American Bible Association was actually created in the 18th century just to print out King James Bibles and sell them in America. About a billion every single year. And they don't like any other Bibles because they have to pay fees for those. They have to pay royalty fees and copyright fees. The King James Bible, there's no copyright. So they can literally just copy and paste, print and sell, and make 100% profit. No overhead. So, yes, there's a, there is a monetary reason why the King James only is pushed in America. Well, let's get back to the Bible, America's favorite national theatrical prop. Totally fabricated story that Frank Lodgson, supposed co-founder of the NASB, that he repented to God for making a new Bible. Frank Lodgson was later discovered to have absolutely nothing to do with the creation of the NASB. This is all nonsense and propaganda by the American Bible Society. Things that I guess some of our listeners have been wondering about, Gail, is when did the new versions first appear in America? Are these brand new things that just came about in the last 20 or 30 years? Well, you know, the Titanic traveled to America from England in 1912. This was the same year as the corrupt American Standard Version. And coincidentally, it was a man named Murdoch who threw the famous Titanic into reverse, causing it to sink. Now, scientists have just discovered that, of course, it wasn't a big gash, but as previously thought, that sunk the Titanic, but six small slits. And today's NIV has cut out 64,000 words and 16 verses. Now, back in 1912, the New American Standard Bible had Timothy Dwight of the infamous Skull and Bones Society as a committee member. I have an educated guess about why the Titanic sunk and why the NIV will eventually sink in the lake of fire. The Titanic was from something called the... So this is what, they, this is what these people do. They, they take three numbers completely unrelated from each other and put them together and make 666 out of it whenever they don't like something. Or if they like something and they want to bless it, they'll make a 1611 out of it. They'll just add and subtract whatever numbers they got to find. They just put stuff together that makes no sense. They, they just literally took look, a six from small slits, a six from how many words they wanted to add to, to these Bibles they don't like, and then 16 verses, and then they took three sixes out of those three different non rely non-relatable things and made it 666 out of it unbelievable they do this all the time you'll see this all the time and all these christians that go to these churches they don't even notice it they're just like amen 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 you start clapping like 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 it makes sense i, I couldn't believe it 1990s there's an underground movie called lucifer rising and the soundtrack was done by that rock group Led Zeppelin. So 
things seem to really come around that way. You know, the word for star in Hebrew is kokab, and it does not appear at all in Isaiah 14, 12. God uses the word star in verse 13. If he wanted to use it, he could have used it in verse 12. In fact, God uses the word star about 30-some times in the Old Testament, and he does not use it in Isaiah 14, 12. So they're really giving us something very, very bad there. As a matter of fact, there's a book on the bestsellers list called The Origin of Satan, and right now it's on the bestsellers list, and it reaffirms this heresy. It says, quote, the serpent is actually Christ. So the public is being progressively taught this, and the Theosophical Society said they were going to do this through the churches. Now, the new versions are already having their effect on the churches, Ken. Two so-called Christian books are introducing this lie. The first is called The Mighty Warrior it's by Elizabeth Alves, and it tells Christians to rebuke the morning star since the author thinks the morning star is Satan. So can you imagine praying and rebuking Jesus Christ? That would be a sorry thing to do. Now, the second book is Absolute Blasphemy. It's called Satan Who. It's available in Christian bookstores. It's by a gentleman named Carl Barton, and it states that Lucifer is not Satan, and that God himself is really the dragon and the shining one and the creator of all evil. And both of these books are available in Christian bookstores. Can you imagine? This is either a complete lie or she's just an idiot. Because this is so demonstrably false that it's not even funny. There's no Lucifer in any Hebrew. Lucifer is a, a Latin word from a Greco-Roman deity. Lucifer the light bearer. It's from the planet Venus. So there's no Lucifer. That's a modern translation from only Latin manuscripts. There's not a single Greek manuscript that has the word Lucifer in it. And um, it does actually have the word star in it because it has the word Hallel, which is morning star. And I can show you this right now, demonstrated. So she's wrong, and everyone agrees, but every scholar agrees with me on this. Go check for yourself. The King James is the only Bible that has the wrong translation here. Or actually, I shouldn't say the only one. Any of the Bibles that have the word Lucifer is incorrect. Ask a Jew if they know what Lucifer is. They don't. There's no Lucifer in Judaism. Imagine a college-educated American not knowing when a preacher's lying to him. According to Dr. Ehrman, there are several issues with the King James Bible that fall into three categories. Changes in the English language since 1611 that can affect how modern English readers interpret the Bible today, theological biases in the translation, and issues with the manuscripts used when creating the translation in the first places. For example, many of you might be familiar with the fact that unicorns appear in the King James Bible. Deuteronomy 33:17 mentions his glory is like the firstling of his bullock, and his horns are like the horns of unicorns. This is probably a mistranslation of a Hebrew word that probably refers to some sort of wild ox. The Greek word for single horned beast somehow found its way into the Greek Septuagint translation of the Hebrew Bible, which then ended up in the KJV. Other mythological creatures appear in the KJV as well, but I personally feel this is pretty minor compared to other issues with the text. But what I think is even more serious than outdated words are verses that look like they make sense in modern English, but actually mean something completely different. For example, check out Philippians 3.20. The KJV says, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. What the KJV translates as conversation is the Greek word polituma, which means citizenship or commonwealth. Thus, the NRSV translates it as, but our citizenship is in heaven. And it helpfully includes a footnote directing the reader to the alternate translation, commonwealth. In my opinion, the KJV translation is a serious problem. If you're conducting a Bible study and you're trying to explicate this verse while relying on the KJV, the translated word conversation could trip you up. It could cause you to miss a very interesting aspect to what the Apostle Paul is trying to say by using this word with political and administrative undertones. Imagine a college-educated American not knowing when a preacher's lying to him. Theological biases of the translators. Several passages in the King James Bible seem to be the result of Christian theological biases swaying the translator's decision-making. Another example of theological bias comes from 1 John. For those of you that are familiar with Christian doctrine, you'll know that God is conceptualized as one being with three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, aka the Trinity. In the King James Bible, 1 John 5 verses 7 through 8 include an explicitly Trinitarian formula. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. 
This phrase appears in the Latin translation of the Bible, but not in any Greek translation. It almost certainly was not part of the original text of 1 John. For these Protestants, fundamentalism is actually a term of self-description, a label for those who hold to certain fundamentals of the faith. Starting in 1910, a Protestant Christian group published a series of essays called The Fundamentals that stipulated what all Christians should believe, though through a Protestant lens. According to the historian George Marsden, Protestant fundamentalism really took off in the 1920s, though, as a reactionary backlash against modernism, a backlash against the theory of evolution, growing popularity of liberal theology, and biblical critical scholarship. As you might have picked up in this video, the publication of new Bible translations was the animating force behind the King James Onlyist movement. All of the criticism was leveled against scholarly critical editions. You want to see how the King James Bible was, was put together. There are problems with the King James Bible, I think. In terms of its usability today by people who want to know what the biblical authors actually said. Now that's a different issue from, do you want to read a great English classic? If you want to read a great English classic, the King James Bible is the translation to read. But if you want to know what the biblical authors actually said, the King James Bible has some problems and I want here are some examples. Almud, Album, Charashim, Chode, Cracknels. These are in the King James Bible. Gat, Hagergion, Hosen, Gat, Leader, Niece, Nusings, Ouches, Ring Strike, Sick of Mind, Trow, and Wimples. Uh, there are a lot more. And I bet you don't know what these words mean. <laughs> what, is, what does Almud mean? I have no idea. <laughs> I think you put it in an apple pie, but I'm not sure. <laughs> the King James has uh, interesting choices about which animals they name. Okay, so, so the problem with animals in the Bible, Bible translators sometimes don't know how to translate certain words. I mean, modern, today, even 400 years later, we don't know how to translate some words in the Bible. Because you know it's talking about some kind of four-legged creature, and that's all you know. So what... What do you call it? Well, the King James, uh, you know, so in the King James, you've got unicorns and satyrs and dragons and cockatrices and arrow snakes. Uh, the first four are legendary creatures and the fifth doesn't exist. <laughs> it's not even a legendary creature. Nobody knows what it is. So, uh, so uh, yeah, modern translations uh, don't use those. Uh, so, well, that's a problem if you're reading a passage and it's using one of these words, you know, so uh, that's a problem. Some phrases in the King James Bible no longer make sense. <laughs> Ouches of gold, collops of fat, naughty figs, <laughs> lean with, lean with, I guess, the ground is chapped, a brazen wall, rentest thy face, and murrain of the cattle. So uh, you get words, you get phrases, you get sentences that simply don't work in English anymore. <laughs> and Jacob saw a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call him Emmanuel. In the book of Matthew, in the New Testament, quoting Isaiah chapter 7. Now, this is complicated, but when Matthew is quoting Isaiah, he's not quoting the Hebrew of Isaiah, he's quoting the ancient Greek translation of Isaiah, which does use the word virgin. But the Hebrew Bible that is the base for the Greek translation and for the King James Version, doesn't say virgin. In the Hebrew Bible, it says a young woman has conceived and will bear a son. The Hebrew word is alma, a young woman. It's not bethula, which means a virgin. And so there's nothing in this passage about the woman being a virgin. <coughs> She's a young woman. And that makes perfect sense in the context of Isaiah. A young woman will conceive or has conceived, and by the time her son is old enough, these kingdoms are, these kings are going to be disappear. Well, the King James translators are being influenced by their knowledge of the quotation of this passage in Matthew and by their belief that Jesus was born of a virgin, and so they put it back onto Isaiah, even though it wasn't originally there. See what I mean? So it's a it's a it's a bias of the translator that's affecting the translation. And so in most modern translations today, Isaiah 7, 14 will be translated, a young woman will conceive or has conceived and will bear a son. Uh, whereas in Matthew, of course, it's translated virgin because that's the word that's used there. 
All right, so, uh, so anyway, so that's, that's a case where you're not really seeing what Isaiah had to say because the, the translator's bias has gotten in the way. Let me then go into something that came by the Christmas season. And obviously, many people will be asking about Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, correlating to Matthew 123. But one of the critical things that is raised is that this refers to the virgin birth. And then there is a reference to the lineage of Joseph with an attempt to attach that to Jesus, to the Davidic lineage. How do you see this where if there is a lineage, does that mean there is no virgin birth? If there's virgin birth, there is no lineage and you can't have both of them. And how do you actually ascertain Jewish lineage in the first place? Because at the end of the day, if Jesus is born of a virgin supernaturally, would he then be viewed as somebody who has a lineage to David? You're raising a question that's so plain that people frequently miss it. The church initially does not adopt the notion that Jesus was born of a virgin. We could see that from the earliest writings chronologically in the New Testament. So Paul either didn't think it was important enough to mention that Jesus was supernaturally conceived or really a lot more likely, he didn't know anything about a virgin birth. The earliest gospel, Mark, also doesn't mention a virgin birth, in truth, because neither the author of Mark nor Paul believed that Jesus was born of a virgin. We only have two books in the Christian Bible, written rather late in the first century, probably around 385 Matthew and Luke, that mention a virgin birth. The virgin birth is necessary because as the Christian religion is moving into the Gentile arena even more and more, it adopts more and more ideas from the Greco-Roman world that surround it rather than any possible Jewish origin. When Matthew adopts the idea that Jesus was born to a virgin, and we have an infancy narrative in Matthew 1 and 2, what he does by claiming that Jesus was born to a virgin disqualifies him completely from being the Messiah. Because in order to be the Messiah, you have to come from the house of David. Your genealogy is identified by your father's house, Numbers chapter 1, really all over the place. That's why in the genealogy, it's, it's men that matter, even in in, in the genealogy found in both Matthew 1 and Luke 3. Your tribe identity is passed on in a patrilineal column. Mothers in, don't matter in this regard. So by claiming that Jesus lacked a human Jewish father, it raises staggering problems. Number one, he can't trace his genealogy back to King David. He can't because the genealogy the Old Testament predicted that the Messiah would come from the line of David. And both Matthew and Luke provide genealogies of Jesus that confirm that he was a descendant of David, therefore a legitimate Messiah. He was a legitimate claimant to the throne of Israel. Each genealogy also brings out themes that are important to that particular gospel writer. Matthew's genealogy goes from Jesus to Abraham. Abraham, of course, was the father of the Jewish nation. And so Matthew emphasizes the Jewishness of Jesus. Luke's genealogy goes all the way back to Adam, the father of the human race, stressing then the universality of the gospel message. It's a message for all people everywhere. While the two genealogies, Matthew and Luke's, are basically the same from Abraham to David, from David to Jesus, they're different. Matthew follows the line of David's son, Solomon while Luke follows the line of Nathan, another son of David. So how do we account for two different genealogies? How do we account for these differences? Some argue that either Matthew or Luke got it wrong. They created or borrowed a genealogy in order to provide Jesus with a legitimate ancestry. Yet there are other possible explanations for the two different genealogies. The simplest solution is that we have genealogies of both parents of Jesus, 
Joseph and Mary. In this case, Luke would be giving us Mary's genealogy and Matthew gives us Joseph's genealogy. This actually makes good sense since Luke's birth narrative focuses on Mary, tells the story from his perspective. Message. It's a message for all people everywhere, or a legitimate Messiah. He was a legitimate claimant to the throne of Israel. Now, this is when I began to realize that there, the problems go back to Christianity itself. So this is a problem that stems from the actual religion. That's why the King James only people are so corrupt. This is this is this started in the beginning. The problem is from the Septuagint and the translations just get worse and worse and worse because they're trying to cover each other up. And so what we have here, we have a problem with the genealogy, first of all. Luke and Matthew have two different genealogies. Now this guy's saying that the reason why is because one's for Mary, one's for Joseph, but that's not true because they both say Joseph, father of Jesus. And then the, we, we also don't have Joachim, who is the father of Mary, and he's not in either of the genealogies. So that means that they're both genealogies are for Joseph, but they're both different. So we have conflicting genealogies, which means the Bible's wrong, which means it can't be divinely inspired. We also have another verse right here. It's from Matthew 2.23. It says, and he should be called a Nazarene, spoken by the prophets. Well, you can scour all the prophets, even even find ones that aren't that didn't make the cut, like Sirach, and they, they just, this verse does not appear. This is a fake verse from Christianity. So I've just demonstrated that Christianity is a false religion. Or a legitimate Messiah. Since 1611, a lot of manuscripts have been discovered of the New Testament. Greek manuscripts. Uh, the New Testament was originally written in Greek. It was copied in Greek, and copies of those copies were copied over the over the years, over the centuries. Today, we have something like 5,600 copies of the New Testament in Greek. The King James translation was based on like eight or ten, and the eight or ten they used weren't very good. Now, it's all they had available to them. But since then, we've discovered thousands. But it means that we know more what the original text said because of these thousands, they're all different from each other. They have different wording here and there in the other place. And these few that were available to the King James translators were not very, very early. They were ancient. I mean, they, they, were, they were not very ancient. And in some places, they, were, they, were, they had mistakes in them from copies making mistakes. This led to, to a lot of problems. Here's one of the key ones. Um, 1 John chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. This is, this is called the Johannine comma. Uh, Erasmus was the first to publish a Greek New Testament in printed form. Over the centuries, people have copied them by hand. Printing was invented in the 15th century. Erasmus was the first to produce a printed Greek New Testament. And in his printed Greek New Testament, he didn't have that verse. They had the Trinity in it. And the reason was because the manuscript he used for 1 John didn't have the verse in it. Well, uh, so what happened, what happened was Erasmus' translate, uh, version didn't have it, and people got really upset because they said, you took out the Trinity. <laughs> and uh, Erasmus said, I didn't take out the Trinity. It wasn't in my Greek manuscript. And he said, I looked at other Greek manuscripts. They don't have it either. But it was in the Latin Vulgate. It was in the Latin, and so they said, but it's, you know, it should be in there. And Erasmus apparently said, if you can find me a man Greek manuscript with that verse, and I'll put it in my next edition. And so they produced a manuscript. In fact, they literally produced a <laughs> manuscript. <laughs> apparently what happened is somebody copied, out a man copied it out in Greek, and when they got to this passage, they translated the Latin into Greek and put the verse in. And so Erasmus, who agreed to put it in his next edition, put it in his next edition, and so now the verse is in his, in his second edition. And that's the edition that's the basis for the King James translation. So that's why it made it into English. See, it's now found in John chapter seven and eight, but in fact, it's not in our ancient manuscripts. It was only in the later manuscripts that it was found and so it made it into the King James Bible, so it came into English, so everybody knows the story, but it's not original to the New Testament. It was added by a later scribe. I think it should be noted that 
out of all the verses in the New Testament, the one verse that's contested as being a later edition is the only verse that says that there's a trinity. Everything else is always just implied there's a trinity. This is the only verse that actually says that these these three are equal. So it's kind of, it's just what are the odds, right? It just tells you where how Christianity evolved over the years, how the divinity of the prophet Jesus was an ev evolution over time. It didn't start that way. And that can be easily proven too. Bart Arman here tells you that Jesus became a god and he wasn't a god in the first century. This was a second and third century idea. King James Bible came out where they got rid of all the these and thous but left all the problems. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> the result is there are many thousands of differences among different King James Bible in spelling and punctuation, even though the wording has remained virtually intact, but the payoff is there's no one King James Bible. So if somebody says, you know, I just followed the King James Bible, you have to ask, well, which one do you follow? Because it's, there are different ones. So the truth is the King James Bible uses modern manuscripts, Latin mostly, it uses the Tyndale as a skeleton. It does not follow the ancient manuscripts. It follows more of the modern ones. It adds verses. It rearranges the orders of the books. Uh, the Masoretic text, the Hebrew Bible, ends with um, Nehemiah. And the King James Bible, the prophets start with Ezra and Nehemiah. So they, they literally, literally reverse the order of the prophets because it makes it mo the order more favorable for Christianity. That's the whole point of the, of the Christian Bible being different from the Hebrew Bible, is they change things around and make it more fitting, like the word virgin. But um, some people will argue and say, oh, these changes, these 400 changes over the two centuries from 1611 to 1865, these are, these are just spelling. No. Look at here. Tribe of Manasseh, the tribe of the children of Manasseh. They added a word there. I mean, I'm looking at this NIV pamphlet they gave me, and that would be a big deal. They would condemn that. Thou art Christ, thou art the Christ. There is no good man, there is no good man. Seek good, seek God. Inherit, inherit Gad. They changed it into a, from God into a, one of the tribes of, of uh, Israel. These are big changes. He went to the house, she went into the city. They changed the gender there. These are doctrinal changes. That's what they would tell me about the NIV. So what's up with the double standard there? Imagine a college-educated American not knowing when a preacher's lying to him.